Um, instead, I'll tell you a little bit about what we're going to bring you. We've been collaborating with seafood businesses uh, to understand where we can add more value and facilitate knowledge sharing. Um, together, we identified a gap and an opportunity for Seafish to host a collection of masterclasses to help businesses across industry with their own marketing efforts, which in turn supports and drives an increase in seafood consumption. And that's what we're all about. Um, that's why we're here today. It's about providing businesses um, with tools, ideas and skills to engage consumers across the UK. So in time, those consumer attitudes towards <laughs> seafood will change and people will start eating more fish and more shellfish more often. We launched our new consumer brand, Love Seafood, in 2020. It's an ambitious long-term initiative which has been built to unite a diverse seafood industry under a single common message and goal. It's all about inspiring the nation to fall in love with fish and shellfish. With Love Seafood, we'll help consumers across the UK uh, reconnect with buying and eating seafood by promoting three pillars, choice, convenience, and balanced living. So how will we do all of that? Well, we'll encourage consumption of seafood at home and outside the home, when that's possible, 365 days a year. So Love Seafood is ultimately a 20 year always on approach to seafood campaigning, which highlights industry champions like you guys and provides audience relevant advertising or content to inform and inspire the nation. So we've built the platform to provide seafood businesses with support and tools to help communicate directly with consumers when possible. And that kind of leads me on to the value of today's session. So I'd like to introduce you all to our very special guest speaker today. Um, her name is Leah Silverlock and she's from the John Doe Agency, one of our agency partners on Love Seafood. Whilst we're here in the background to help you and your business make most of the Love Seafood brand and assets, Leah is going to connect the dots with access to her insight, ideas and knowledge, which will support your own social media marketing efforts. So Leah, a very warm welcome from us to you and thank you so much for joining us. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen just now so you can share yours um, and the stage is yours. Great, thank you so much. I'm going to do the usual. Can everybody see that? Good. Um, so as Greg, Greg mentioned, my name is Leah Silverlock and I lead on all things social media here at John Doe which essentially means that I work with brands to help them shape, manage and grow their audiences and grow their social media footprint. And today we're gonna to work through a couple of elements. So we're gonna look at the current social media landscape. We're gonna do some platform discussions and look at what social media can bring to the table and how we can talk to the people that we need to talk to. We'll just dive right in. Um, as Greg mentioned, um, if you do have questions, just pop them into the chat and we'll pick them up at the end. There's also a couple of um, slides towards the end where we can get to know each other's businesses. Um, if you're maybe feeling a little bit shy and you don't want to ask a question, but there are people here who do want to ask questions and are a little bit more confident, would definitely encourage you to tell me about your business. And if you see something or we're going through things today and you're thinking, wow, this PowerPoint is great, I love it, but it hasn't answered my question and I really want to ask that, then definitely go for it because that that also might be somebody else's question. So definitely encourage you to pop things in the chat or make mental notes and then we can come back to it later. So we're gonna look at the current social media landscape at the moment. So we've got here five platforms. Um, you might notice that there are two missing, which are Snapchat and Pinterest. I identified these five as I thought that they might be the most valuable to this audience. Um, but again, if we are missing some things, speak to the Love Seafood team afterwards. And when we're sending this deck around afterwards with notes, I can include one or two slides about Snapchat and about Pinterest. So <laughs> I'm just gonna run through the purpose of each social media platform and what you might find on there or what you could be creating on there. 
So our purpose for Facebook is broadcast, essentially. So think like a publisher, tell stories that really evoke emotion, um, use groups, which we're going to talk about a little bit later, and use the space to really kind of nurture and grow communities. Um, Twitter, the purpose here is to really flex that tone of voice. So we're talking about things that are happening now. It's conversational. It's designed for quick, reactive commentary. Um, it's best used for customer engagement, customer service, um, having an opinion. A lot of people on that platform are very bold and brave, and they like to make statements. Um, some of you might have seen one on Monday from Burger King. Some of you might not. Um, but yeah, people like to be a little bit controversial on this platform. Instagram, our purpose here is to inspire. So users are more likely to shop here or on Facebook. Um, but if you're not selling something physical, um, we can use it to humanize the brand. So for example, at Love Seafood, we're not selling seafood products, but we are here to inspire people to buy seafood products or to consume seafood products through uh, recipes or kind of fun interactive gifts, stories, things like that. Um, for TikTok, our purpose here is to motivate action. Um, most people, or not most people, but some people think that it's just an entertainment space. It's definitely not. It's very educational. There's a huge trend at the moment in learning languages on the platform. Um, so yeah, it's there to educate and also it can also help you to build out your brand personality. And we'll also talk about that a little later on. LinkedIn, which potentially might be everyone here's favorite platform. I know it's definitely one of mine, um, is thought leadership. Our purpose here really is to uh, share opinion, whether that's through employees. So employees can be really great, valuable assets here. They can be excellent advocates. Or we're sharing opinion through our business pages. Um, what we find is that it's tends LinkedIn tends to work better alongside Twitter. So you can have long form opinion and then short, quick bursts. Um, and yeah, a, opinion based, what's trending right now in the news or within your industry that you're up, operating in. And it's all about teaching someone something. And then obviously you've got the more functional side of, of LinkedIn, which is um, job hunting or uh, recruitment. So there's a couple of snapshots just of audiences on this slide as well. So for example, you know, 2 billion active users on Facebook and um, the largest demographic is 35 to 55. And um, if we move on to Twitter, so 328 million active users on, on this platform, uh, Instagram, 500 million active users, um, TikTok, I'm, I'm not going to run through them all, but just picking out one or two, um, TikTok 17 million daily active users, um, 18 to 24 year olds being the, the largest demographic, and then LinkedIn 300 million daily users. And um, our brands using social media, yes, they 100% are. So I'm gonna do a couple of little myth busting slides next. So our brands using social media, yes, there's 90 million businesses on Facebook and 91% of fast moving goods. Brands use two or more social media channels. Doesn't mean that you have to, but that's just the stat. 68% um, of Instagram users engage with a brand regularly. So whether that's through a DM, they're liking some content, they're watching stories, they're making comments, they're saving or they're sharing that content. Um, and 42% of Twitter users say that their first, 42% um, of customers, sorry, say that their first point of, of contact for a brand is usually Twitter. And that's potentially because Twitter is reactive, it's in real time, you're more likely to get a response because it's out in public. Um, there's no hiding really. So myth busting, um, likes and followers are what truly matter. Um, this is not the case. Reaching the right audience is definitely what truly matters. Um, people who are aware of the social media industry or if there are any marketers here might know this or might have heard of this, but 
Facebook and Instagram are making huge changes to get rid of vanity metrics. So that journey started for Facebook in 2018 when they introduced what the industry calls Facebook Zero. So they made a commitment to bring Facebook back to more of a community space and create native functions that will inspire community engagement. So whether that's groups or um, events, and they're really looking to prioritize those over and above high reaching content or advertising content. And then they've also recently committed to removing likes from Facebook pages and changing the language around that to become a follow. So just shifting the language a little bit to create something more meaningful for people on that, on, on that platform within that space. So by removing the word like, and changing it to follow, they are basically trying to say that people will follow something because it's meaningful to them. They've made a connection. It means something. So I'm a fan. I'm going to follow you because I want to be here. Um, whereas a like is a little bit more vacant, a little bit more of a vanity metric. Um, and Instagram are doing the same. So they're currently testing a lot of features out that will remove likes from Instagram. Um, I, as an Instagram user, will be able to see my likes, but you, as someone who has just discovered my account, will not be able to see likes. Um, so yeah, so it's about reaching people. It's about creating connection, meaningful, valuable content over and above vanity metrics. There might be some CEOs in here that are dead against that and they just want to see vanity metrics. They want to see high numbers. Um, but to make it work, it's really about creating that that connection with, with your audience. Um, my business should be on as many platforms as possible. Um, incorrect. Uh, too many channels can definitely dilute your message. It can decrease the quality of, of your content. If you are someone who is very lucky enough to be in a huge social media marketing team and you have massive resource, then yes, definitely be on every single platform that's possible because you'll no doubt have a strategy for every single platform. You'll have individual content creators. Um, you'll be able to do so much. But if you are a resource of two people, one person potentially, if you, you know, you're an entrepreneur, you own your own business and it's just you, then being across everything is time consuming. It can cause fatigue it can become overwhelming um, and if you're just copying and pasting the same thing across all of your channels you're not really creating value for your audience you're not creating that authentic meaningful connection um, the pandemic has given audiences social media fatigue i hear this a lot people tell me this a lot and i can definitely say that it is not true i think potentially we're all fatigued by uh, Zoom and by speaking to a screen um, and potentially parents want their children to be fatigued by social media, but it's definitely not true. Social media users have jumped by 20.4% in the past 12 months. This could be for a number of reasons. You know, the UK discovered TikTok, I discovered TikTok and I'm not 18. Um, and I think potentially people have a lot more time or people want to use social media to connect with other people. So social media users has definitely jumped. There is not fatigue. Don't let them fill you. Um, you can't track and measure accurate results. So I actually still hear this quite a lot and it's a bit of a hangover from um, six, seven years ago when analytics weren't as strong across multiple platforms, but they were really strong on Facebook. Not the case anymore, everything you do, whether it's on TikTok, Pinterest, Snapchat, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and you're just, um, you're just a user, you're not a business profile, you can track everything that you do and you can create great analytics. So definitely not true. You can track everything and you can see numbers going up and down. And when you start to see numbers going up and you start to see your reach going up and you can see your hard work paying off, it's a really great feeling. Social media is for young people. Um, not true. Baby boomers, uh, 55 year olds and 65 year olds are the fastest growing demographic on two of the biggest platforms, Facebook and Instagram. Um, and that's over the past 18 months. 
So huge, huge interest from 55 to 65 year olds. Uh, it's not just for young people. I'm gonna move on to the value of social media. So if there are any questions on any of what we've just spoken about, just pop them in the chat and Jacob will pick them up and then we'll discuss them later. So when we talk about social media, marketing, we're referring to how it can help you meet your goals. You know, it's not, um, it's not really a, a standalone tool to market your business. It should definitely fit in with a 360 marketing plan, 360 marketing strategy. It's, it's there to help you spread the message. It's, it's not the kind of one and only thing that you should be doing. It's there to help complement all your other things and all your other activities. Um, and so we talk about raising awareness, targeting consumers, generating leads, driving sales, uh, customer support, and driving web traffic. Um, when we talk about raising awareness, when in social, in our language, in the industry language, that's community management and customer service. Um, so we use those kind of high priority tactics to make our content go a little bit further. So that's really all about reach and engagement. Um, when we're talking about targeting consumers, we are talking about advertising and, um, you know, using built in business managers across your platforms, creating really targeted ads to regions. And um, we are talking about and it, if you are someone who doesn't have a lot of money to spend on on social media, there are other ways that you can do regional targeting. So. Um, we can look at regional targeting of Facebook groups, so joining localized groups. Um, to really spread spread that message. Um, for example, I recently moved to Glasgow and I joined my local Facebook group straight away because that is a great place for information. I can find out when shops are opening again, where's the best place for coffee in the East End. Um, I can find out about you know, local, butcher local butcher deliveries, fishmonger deliveries, um, lots of different things come from these kind of localized small Facebook groups and we will definitely speak about them later um, and also hashtag planning so if you are a business that you know you have beautiful beautiful content you know you've got really beautiful produce and you're skilled at taking photography you, you know you're you're able to create really beautiful content and Instagram is a place that you feel comfortable on and that you want to spread content throughout that platform, then having a really targeted hashtag strategy to go alongside your content is something that's really important there for targeting. Lead generation, again, is at advertising and um, community building is also in here. So using community management and outreach to generate leads. Facebook groups, again, would be considered a lead generation tool and um, really clear links with call to action um, and optimizing channels as well. Um, driving sales, again, optimizing your platforms to make sure that they're ready for direct sales. So if you are using Facebook, you know, definitely make sure that your private messenger is turned on, that people can contact you, people can ask you questions, and also that people can buy direct through your Facebook or people can buy direct through your Instagram or if people are contacting you on Twitter about sales, you know, you can set up automatic messaging that will direct them immediately to the website or it will share links or your customer service info. Um, and yes, there's great little tools there. So it's just about optimizing it and really getting to know your platforms. Um, anything you do can always be undone. So don't ever be afraid to change the settings or do anything like that. It can always be undone. Um, Next one again for driving sales is of course advertising um, customer support. This again is your customer service aspect. So looking at your private messenger, your DMs, how you're optimizing that and um, who's looking after that, who on your resource is able to talk to customers. Um, there is a real customer um, expectation across social media now um, and how users actually behave on the platforms is they expect a certain level of customer service and they expect to be treated online as though they're in a shop so just remember that when you're 
putting content out or you are putting something on sale that people will respect to or will expect to have a back and forth. They will expect to have a really high level of customer service. Um, and, you know, 90% of them are very nice. There's only about 10% that can be a bit impatient. Um, and then driving web traffic. So again, that's about optimizing your platforms, making sure that all of your links work, making sure that if you have, for example, a Facebook business page that you've got a book now button or a buy now button at the top of your page that you are using every opportunity that the platform gives you to drive traffic to your website. Um, and of course there are social media platforms that don't want you to leave, that don't want you to send people away, such as Instagram. Um, they will do everything that they can to keep you on, on the platform and not have link outs, but they've set up now Instagram shopping and all that kind of stuff. So you can also set that up. Um, here. So Facebook. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about this is just kind of the average user so an average user follows 22 facebook business pages and um, half of all those users will engage regularly within a facebook group and um, it's the most social media channel used by all ages globally which is huge and we already touched on the fastest growing demographic um, 48 percent of facebook shoppers in 2020 purchased direct from the platform so that optimization of, of facebook is actually really really crucial um, one of the great things about about social media or about facebook in particular is that it develops native functions so when i say the phrase native functions what that essentially means is facebook creates its own tools for you to use and the more you use those tools the greater success you will have on that platform um which is essentially what when people say algorithm that's what they mean um the algorithm on different social media platforms is just like playing a game so you score points so on facebook the highest ranking point scorer thing that you can do is to use their native functions so if you don't have a high budget, say for example, you really want to do advertising, but you only have a hundred pounds a month and it's a really saturated market because you're doing home deliveries and everybody in your area is doing home deliveries and everyone's talking about it and you don't really know how to break through that noise. How you navigate that is by using native functions. So when we say native functions, we mean Facebook groups, Facebook events, going live, on on Facebook, um, saving content and creating peer to peer conversation. So that's probably the hardest one. If we go back to Facebook groups. You can create your own Facebook group. You can join other Facebook groups. Um, you can contact admins and ask to cross post, or you can just be an active member of 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 different Facebook groups. The more you do that, the longer and harder your content will work. Um, going live, um, really great, great function. If you, for example, are a restaurant and you're not open right now, but you have great staff, you've got a, a great chef who's you know really charismatic and you wanna put him in front of a camera, great, go live on Facebook and teach someone, teach people how to use certain or teach people how to prepare certain seafood or a certain fish um, teach them a recipe teach them how to store seafood create some sort of moment that they can take part in while using an, a native function um, an event potentially there aren't going to be any events happening in the next couple of months but again it's a really powerful native function and then peer to peer. So when I say peer to peer, um, going back to Facebook zero, what happened in 2018 when they made that, that commitment to be more community focused, the best thing that you can have on your content. So I create a Facebook post and I publish that, that, that Facebook post. What I want is Mary down the street to tag Janice from down the street and say, hey, did you see this? And I want them to have a conversation I don't want to 
intervene in that conversation too much. I want peer to peer conversation. So essentially creating engagement, engaging content that will sit well with your audience. You're going to want people to tag and share that, that content. So that's a really high, high ranking thing across Facebook. Um, we spoke about uh, Facebook groups a little bit earlier. Um, again, we're just going to touch on it for helping to generate leads um, and providing value through that. Um, Facebook groups is currently and will be for the next at least 24 months the most powerful thing that you can do on Facebook. So creating a group or joining a group is a highly recommended, highly, highly recommended tactic. Um, if you want to create your own Facebook group, great. Do you have a niche? Maybe not. Maybe you are just a local, local restaurant, local fishmonger, um, local producer. Find something that you can create a group around and start bringing people into that space. If you're not comfortable doing that, then join a group that's already there and just start speaking to people. Make yourself known and start warming up those leads because it really is, I can't stress this enough, the most preferred thing to do on Facebook right now. Um, driving sales, again, we've touched on this. So um, advertising um, can be really, really beneficial here on Facebook if you do have the budget to do it. If not, then go back to trying to use those native functions a little bit more um, to make your content work harder. But Facebook has a great business manager. Um, if you have budget to spend on, on ads, it's really, really in intuitive. Um, you know, we can create ads based on engagement or we can have different objectives based on engagement, brand awareness, traffic, conversions. Um, video views is plenty of opportunities um, to drive sales. I'm just going to let somebody into the waiting room. Sorry. Um, Instagram, again, the same kind of format that we've just done. Um, so how can it provide value? So 80% of our users follow, 80% of users follow businesses on Instagram. 65% of the top performing Instagram content features products. So whether that's overtly in your face or in the background. So what that says to us is that users aren't afraid to see a product, they're not put off by a product. Um, user behavior is generally shopping on Instagram now, um, inspiration and then shopping. 68% uh, of users are female and 200 million Instagrammers actively visit the profile of a business every day. So that's a huge number. And um, our native functions here, again, are really, really important. We're looking at Instagram stories, um, guides, if you have them yet, reels, um, grid posts, carousels. Um, these are the kind of top native functions. These are the high ranking things that you can do um, that will make your content go further and will help you to grow your platform. So the more you use Reels, for example, that's the newest native function. So it's the highest ranking. Um, the further that your content will go and the more people that will actually see you because Instagram is in Instagram's best interest to push that as much as possible. So factoring that in is huge. Um, also using different native functions like carousels, everyone's going to be sick of the phrase native functions by the end of this. Um, using carousels, for example, to show your brand portfolio um, is a really, really great high ranking thing to do right now. Um, you know, if you are a fishmonger, for example, let's show, let's show what you've got today, let's show what you've got this week, or if you are, again, talking about a small, small resource team, you can go a different way and you can use your platform to amplify other people's content um, and amplify consumption of seafood that way. So again, if you are a fishmonger, um, let's show people how you can use your produce by sharing other people's content. So by sharing recipes, 
um, and become kind of a user generated platform. So you're just reamplifying really great content that's already out there. Um, and you know that's somewhere where where love seafood can actually help with with the recipes and content packs and the kind of amplification of of content. Um, because I know that potentially we are speaking to teams here who do have little resource, and each one of these platforms can take a lot of time, especially Instagram because there is so much to consider. So that's a great tactic for you if you are in a small resource team create a platform that people will want to be involved in create your own hashtag um, and encourage your customers to use it when they're cooking their food and then you can reamplify that content on your grid you can reamplify it into your stories and it kind of takes the pressure off a little bit of you know constantly creating because instagram as an inspirational and a photography platform will rank your content on how good your photography is. So if it's a high quality picture, you're going to get higher reach, you're going to get higher engagement. If it's a bit blurry, a bit pixelated, it's not formatted for that platform, or it's a small photo, then you will start to lose rank within those within that algorithm. So a great way to negate that is to repurpose other people's content with permission, of course. Um, um, Instagram can also be used to, or it's not just Instagram, social media, um, can be used to create great connections and develop relationships with your customers and consumers. Um, so, you know, taking the time out to thank and to, again, if you were going to use your platform to amplify other people's content, this is a great way to build that connection. Um, you know, creating shout outs to other people within the industry, you know, tagging great work and um, saying thank you to your customers by creating this nice little piece of content um, and then doing shout outs. So it, social can be a great way for you to actually speak direct to your consumers. Um, it can be a great way to share your brand story. If you've got an, a really interesting story, you can use dynamic platforms like TikTok or Instagram stories to create little videos to give people a bit more insight into who you are and what you do, where you come from. And again, you know, I'm not someone who, you know, I work in social media, but I'm not someone who's particularly uh, comfortable being in front of a camera. On, on social media. I mean, I'm doing it now in front of about 60 people, which is fine, but I wouldn't be someone who would have my phone in front of my face and recording content. And that's okay because I can use my brand or I can use my restaurant or my business as the subject matter instead of me and I can do voiceovers. And um, so there's great little kind of workarounds if you're not comfortable in front of the, in front of the camera, you can do a couple of other things that will make you more comfortable. Um, but yeah, it's a great way to share your brand story or it's also a great way to, to create community around your brand. Um, the picture here is Little Moons and I don't know if anybody followed that recently or saw it or has even had it, but they created a huge following on TikTok before they launched. Um, so it's a UK owned small business. They're like little ice cream things. Um, and they created a huge community just by showcasing how they were creating the actual little ice creams, their development process, all these different things. Um, and they sold out across the UK within 24 hours of launching into Tesco. And it became a real status symbol. Um, it created real community interaction and people were tagging different locations of where you might be able to get it across, um, across the UK within different Tesco's. They were giving stock updates. Um, and now what they have for content is, you know, a never ending source of reviews that they can repurpose. Um, and that community is still very active in telling other people about the brand. So it, social can be used as a great tool to kind of build people around what you're trying to sell. Um, Twitter, again, this is just a couple of stats. Um, Twitter is very fast paced. It's very real time conversations. It's excellent for customer service. 
Um, content on Twitter works very differently to how content on platforms such as Facebook and Instagram does. Um, like the, for example, the life cycle of a tweet is 18 seconds. So after 18 seconds, your tweet severely diminishes power. So you lose about 50% of your reach after 18 seconds. So on this platform, you have to constantly be producing, whether you are, you know, just one or two sentences, you're constantly sharing an image, you are talking to people, you just have to constantly be in the conversation. It can be very time consuming, but it can be really worth it because Twitter is great for directing traffic. It can be a great traffic tool. Um, the total number of Twitter users in the UK is 13 million. 54 report taking an action after seeing a brand mentioned in tweets. That's a huge number. 80% um, of users across the platform are on their mobile phone. So that's definitely something to think about when you're creating content is how we consume content. And I think a great reminder of that is how do you look at social media and how do you use it? Because that's probably how other people will use it. And so if you are someone who's only looks at Twitter on their phone or only goes on Facebook on their phone or only goes on Instagram on their phone, then that's kind of what you should be creating content for. 82% of Twitter users say they network they use the network to get their news. So it's a real news source. Um, people are going on there to find out the latest information. Um, again, it's very fast paced, so it really suits that kind of lifestyle. So if you are, for example, if you're a restaurant, Twitter might not be the best place for you to put up your menu every week or um, might not be the best place for you to talk about recipes but it might be a great place for you to bring other restaurants together within a local area and have a Twitter chat every week. Or it might be a great place for you to talk about other brands or talk about brands that you use within your restaurant or talk about local produce, but it might not be a great place for you to put up a piece of content and think that people are gonna to go to your profile to see that content because it won't, be there it'll be it won't be at the top of the feed so it's not really a very powerful use of that platform you want to kind of have rolling content consistently um, um it's a great place to gather feedback to develop further content so for example here we've got a picture of Quantro and they're kind of known for doing this they tend to do a lot of polls um, Twitter also has native functions. Every single platform that we're going to be talking about has native functions. And a great one for Twitter is uh, polls and more recently spaces and threads. So potentially instead of, for example, if you're a restaurant and you're going to put the menu out, instead of doing that, then you can create polls and ask people where do they think your produce comes from or what would they like to see on the menu next week? Things like that. Um, but it, yeah, again, it's, it's a great way to have a kind of conversation about your product or about your brand um, and customer service. We've all been there. Even I've been there, even though I'm usually on the other side of it. I'm usually the person that answers all, all of these questions and deals with all of the customer service element. Um, but yeah, it's a great, a great tool for customer service. Um, and again, a lot of people will assume that you're on Twitter and that's a way to contact you for a really fast response. LinkedIn, it's the number one B2B channel. Um, it now has like 4.2 active job listings. So again, we spoke about that briefly. It is a huge recruitment site. 48% um, of the content is thought um, our thought pieces or kind of industry insight. Um, it's most, it is most used to showcase the industry. Um, there are lots of different conversations happening on Twitter about what is best practice. Should it be long form? Should it be short form? What, what can I talk about? Um, I don't really know my business that well. I would say that the best thing for LinkedIn is employee advocates and 
research in your own industry. So if you are struggling for content on LinkedIn and you're thinking, what am I going to write about? I don't want to seem preachy. Just look at what other people are doing within your industry and follow suit and start to join in conversations. So LinkedIn, again, is very community led and um, it encourages you to comment uh, on pieces on people's content and encourages you to share content and save content. Um, and yeah, and can be a really, really great tool. And we spoke about it earlier, but that employee advocate side of it is a huge, huge way to get your business noticed. Um, and again, it, it might not be the best place for you if you are a restaurant or a fishmonger or you are a small business, but if you are an industry leader or uh, for example, like Seafish, then LinkedIn is a great place for you to talk about things that are things that you're doing, actions that you are taking, tapping into kind of industry news, relevant news, and creating that that content. And it, it allows people to see you as an industry leader. Um, community. So I've mentioned community quite a lot, and um, it is a bit of a it is a bit of a social media term of how we speak about audiences and how we speak about followers or um, fans. We call them communities. So social media communities are essentially online properties in which members relate common experiences and interests. So what we spoke about earlier about people coming together, people creating a community around a brand is essentially what every single social media platform is there for, to build community, to build fans, to build following. Um, and we're gonna look at three, three different types. So there are three main purposes contributing to the sprawl of social media. So there are communities of interest, which we've spoken about. So subjects that people find interesting, topics are created, uh, maintained and populated by everyday people. Um, you know, they're commonly visited, they've got high dwell time. When we say dwell time, we mean that people, and well, I mean, it's pretty self-explanatory, but people are staying on that group for a long time. So it's important to them. They're finding what they need. They're exploring a group or a community or a space similar to a website. So I would, Reddit is probably the most commonly, um, the most common community of interest space. It's not technically a social media site, um, but people will go on Reddit and they'll stay for hours. And that's one of the great things about TikTok. Um, when it was created, that was what they found is that people wanted to stay there for hours. So one of their most powerful attributes is they've got really high dwell time. Um, communities of task. So this focuses on peer-to-peer -peer reviews, um, quick fixed points of action or research, people who seek to fulfill a specific goal. So for example, in the image here, I've put cycling. So that's a real um, community of task. So women cycling, cycling advice, how to fix bikes. Um, so kind of real like functional, practical communities. Um, and then communities of vocation. So this one might be interesting for the seafood community. Um, it's more of a professional focus or um, a place where people are seeking to share advice um, and share knowledge. Um, and they tend to offer very clear boundaries of communication and it's a, bit, a little bit more formal. Um, and so why are communities important? Um, we've discussed this a little bit already, but algorithms, so they are high ranking. So they want Facebook and Instagram really want you to create community around your product. Um, there is a huge mistrust within social media platforms, within digital platforms, and that has been ongoing for the past about six years, but it's getting a little bit stronger now. Um, and it's the new word of mouth. So community groups or communities are highly valued by their brands because they're the people that sell their product. 
they're the people that tell their friends about the product they're the people that it's essentially like a, a kind of notice board it's it's become the new community hub or the new local notice board um the new trip advisor people will often take to social media first to say if something's great or say if something is bad so how do i manage my community um community management is i guess it's it, it's a really involved task if you have a big resource team so for example in my role i will work with different brands and create um, space within my day to talk to different members of their community. So I will answer comments, I will invite people to like the page, I will like comments, react to comments, but I'll also identify different ways in which I can create outreach opportunities. So if it's region based, for example, I can pick a brand and pick a competitor and then look through their competitor audience and follow their journey around social, start liking their content. That's kind of community management from my, from my, my professional end, but community management, if you are a small business or you are an in-house brand managing that, that team, you are essentially just talking to your customers. You're just creating authentic connection. You're creating moments with people who are taking the time to comment and like on, on your content. So it's the real social element of social media. Um, you're taking the time to acknowledge people, to say hi, to create conversation, to direct them to the website. Um, it's the non-sales side of customer service, I guess is a really simple way to put it. Um, so for how we manage it, so again, it's four parts, customer service, creating meaningful conversation, um, creating opportunities to bring the brand to life or opportunities to direct off to the website or to find more information. Um, and it's an opportunity to bring the kind of brand and community together. I'm just gonna look at a couple of examples now. So um, I'm not sure if anybody saw this happen a couple of years ago, but this is a great example of um, community management. So Skyscanner, there was a def there was a fault on their website um, that meant that someone was going to have a 47 year layover in, um, sorry, a 47, a 47 year layover in Sydney or Bangkok. Um, and they were just like, what's happening? How can I have this? Um, and Skyscanner responded, they gave them some really great information about what they could do when they were um, stranded for 47 years. They um, really took it with a pinch of humor. And then the community started coming in behind it saying, this is a great response. They love it. Thank you very much. So instead of going hard hitting, we're so sorry, this will never happen again. This is what happened. It was very much like, we can fix this for you, but in, in the meantime, this is what you can do. And it also gave a great opportunity for Skyscanner to show that they know their destinations, that they're not just a place where you can buy a flight. They're a place where you can find out information about destinations. So it's a good, a good lesson in some destination marketing. Weedabix, which I'm sure everybody saw um, this month. Um, so Weedabix put Heinz beans on their Weedabix, the internet went mad. And this is a great example of brand community management because alongside talking to our audiences, as a brand, you monitor your competitors. So every single brand that you see here will have a tracker on every single competitor within this chat. And they're tapping into their audiences by being part of this conversation. So Little are jumping in, Domino's Pizza are probably tracking Little, and they know that if they comment on this, Little, Little's audience is going to see this comment. So it's great brand awareness for each one of these. Um, Nestle, this is how not to react to um, some comments. So um, a year or two ago, Nestle went through a lot of issues with kind of um, sustainability and 
um, ethical um, ethical ways of working. And some people were making not so great comments. And instead of ignoring them or instead of directing them to a space on the website that would have a statement, the Nestle team decided to take on all of these comments and it just got a little bit out of hand. Um, the best practice here is to try and diffuse a situation because all of this is public and it will never go away. Um, diffuse a situation, take it offline if you can. Um, the same that you would do with a customer in store. Um, try to calm it down, try to listen to what they're trying to say, but not be patronizing or um, have a very hard line. Um, so yeah, and this kind of just turned a little bit nasty where Nestle started to get a little bit personal and we're just very rude. Um, negativity, responding to uh, negative reviews. Um, again, this is not how you would respond. So, you know, someone arrived and um, the manager was late they weren't given the right room you know it was just bad experience after bad experience and instead of apologizing or thanking the customer or highlighting the kind of actions that you're going to take to improve this experience um this business decided to just say honestly what do you expect you pay little you get cheap they're a budget hotel and they were quite rude and um, another Another example of some negativity, and it was actually brought to my attention by Andy from Seafish, is that there's been a lot of um, phishing or troll uh, accounts across the Seafish community or across the food and drink community in particular. So people that are setting up home deliveries, um, creating fake accounts, and also using those accounts to spread negativity. Um, and, you know, creating fake fake reviews and um, if that does happen obviously report those accounts and make sure that you're taking those those right processes per platform um, but yeah the best thing to do there is to just get them deleted um content i'm just conscious of time i'm not running over um so the value of social media content um, telling brand stories, educating, inspiring, creating mean meaningful connections, uh, driving actions. So the stories that we share, you know, they're helping to build connection. They're helping to tell people who we are. Um, and social is very much about that. Social is about being social. It's not about just putting a piece of content up that's just an, an ad. You really want to create a story you want to create meaningful connections and um, you want to be impactful you want to add value where you can um, and all of this can really come from your overall kpis and kind of what you're there to do and what your business needs to do um, a couple of examples um, so I don't know if anybody follows this account, but what Willie Cooks is um, a really great food account from the creators of Mob Kitchen, um, huge on, on Instagram, they create content regularly. Um, but the opportunity here is using video content to educate and inspire audiences. So they create content that um, is all based ar around food. It's based around dishes that you think that you can't make at home. Um, and there are some great dishes here about seafood. So he does a little bit of myth busting um, with a little bit of humor. Um, but that's a great way to show that we all know that people are maybe a little bit afraid of cooking seafood or they don't know how to store it or there's a little bit of hesitation there. So they've identified that and decided, right, well, whenever we cook seafood, we're going to educate. We're going to talk about how you store seafood, how you cut seafood, how you cook it, and um, where's the best place to buy it from, and what flavors go with what seafood. Um, innocent drinks opportunity here was to highlight and educate on benefits of products. So again, this could be useful within um, the seafood community. Um, you know, are we talking about different kinds of proteins, fats, or are we talking about um, it's 
cheaper than X, Y, and Z, or it's got a delicate taste or different kind of benefits that aren't necessarily physical, but just benefits to someone's life. And then how do we identify opportunities? So I popped this slide in here to encourage people to tell me about their business and I can help you identify opportunities. Um, I'm happy to do this at the end or we can do it now. It's up to Jacob. Hi, Leah. I think it's Greg here. We will we'll crack through this um, okay. and then we will come to questions at the end. If anyone has okay. any, I'm, I'm conscious we're quite close to four o'clock now. If okay. anyone has any, we can stick them in the chat. We will continue on. We will record all of our answers to the questions, Leah. So okay. you're not going to get away scot-free. We will ask you as many <laughs> as we can afterwards. But um, no, please do crack on for now and then we'll come to the end and ask. Okay, cool. Well, we are almost at the end. Um, there's just a, a note on the resources from Love, Love Seafood. I know that the Love Seafood team will be able to tell you a little bit more about it, but there are, within those content packs and those resource packs, there are recipes. There's also assets to use alongside recipes. Um, potentially, you might have your own recipes to share, um, but there are pieces of content there that are optimized for different social media platforms that you can use. Um, and then I'm just going to put these all up. So these are just a couple of different websites and different kind of directors to places where you can get content. So the Love Seafood Assets is in the Asset Bank. Um, and any questions about um, more about this can be directed to the Love Seafood team who are always on, on hand to help. Um, but even if you wanted to ask questions on the Love Seafood social channels, um, you'll, you'll get me so you, you'll know who I am so please say hi definitely ask questions and I can connect you with the Love Seafood team and then we've already briefly spoken about these different tactics and I'm just conscious of time so um native functions what are they we've spoken about Facebook and Instagram uh, TikTok's the only one that we haven't spoken about so duets and live um, and then videos so again why these are important is they are high ranking within algorithms. They're a great way to make your content work faster, work harder, get in front of more people um, and score points within, within the algorithm. Um, and then create where you consume. Again, we touched on this briefly. Um, if you are an Instagram user and you only use Instagram, and you're a small business, you're an entrepreneur, your business should be on Instagram because that's where you consume content. That's where you spend your time on social and that's where you're most comfortable. Always start in a place where you're most comfortable and where you find content easy to consume and where, because you're more likely to create content on that platform and be on that platform more because you're already comfortable with that space. And then that's it. So time for questions you can ask me anything if there's things i didn't mention or questions that you had um, about things that i have talked through or again if there are opportunities like we spoke about earlier if you wanted to tell me about your business and i can help identify opportunities if you're struggling with content Leah, thank you so much. Um, that was a fantastic session. We Just for everyone's information, we, we're going to hang around. I'm conscious it's almost four o'clock. If you have to leave us, that's okay. Sorry. No, Leah, don't be daft. It's great to have all the information and the insight from you. Um, we are recording this, so we'll make it available to everybody afterwards. And we will take, we've captured a lot of the questions already. We'll take as many of those now as possible. Um, and then provide that recording to everybody. So um, for me to you, Leah, the Cheerios piece, I think was a winner. I loved that. Mm -hmm. I hadn't seen that on Instagram. It's fantastic. It's um, a great representation of their brand as well, which was lovely. Tips for off camera as well as on camera was good. Um, it can be intimidating sitting there with, mm. with the lens facing you. So it's nice to hear tips and techniques from you about how you can do that without having it right in your face. Um, 18 seconds or die on Twitter was what I wrote. Yeah, that was, that was a good one. <laughs> 18 seconds or you're irrelevant. So you really do need to keep your content fresh there, don't you? And my claim to fame is that I know Jen at Skyscanner. I used to work with her before she started at Skyscanner. And she really did break the internet that day. It was incredible. It was good, yeah. So hats off to her. Um, thank you again. Let's go to some of the questions that we've gathered. So the first okay. one is from somebody who works in graphic design, but they also run social media too. 
Okay. They, they post a lot on Facebook and Instagram, uh, but don't post a lot on LinkedIn. Okay. Um, they'd like to do a bit more on LinkedIn, but they're not sure how to use the platform as it feels a lot more professional. Do you have any tips for LinkedIn as, it, as they kind of view it a little bit differently from other social media? Yeah, my big tip on LinkedIn is it's not about the graphic. So if you are a graphic designer, LinkedIn is not about the asset. It's not about a highly stylized piece of content. LinkedIn is all about the words and about the message. So it's really copy content heavy. Um, I would say the biggest tip is LinkedIn reach and engagement is always slow to start. But again, the more you create on that platform, the further your content will go. So start off small, start off with repurposing things that you already have on other social media platforms that you think are relevant for a professional audience. Repurpose content that you've got on your website that you think could be distilled down into some nice bullet points into a LinkedIn post. Um, and I would say, don't overthink it. Again, it's not graphic, it's not really graphic led. And um, I mean, you'll see a lot of like, LinkedIn gurus creating a lot of fun graphics, but it's not graphic led. It's all about the copy. It's all about the words that you're saying. Um, so yeah, a great place to start is repurpose your social content that you think is fit for a professional audience. Or if you're a consumer facing brand and you're B2C, put a little spin on that kind of B2C element to hit the B2B market. So if you, for example, are a clothing shop and you sell baby clothes, use some stats, use some sale figures, use some industry figures around um, the increase in pregnancies in the pandemic and, and go that way. Um, and increases in mass production, increases in different products. Brilliant, Leah, thank you very much. Okay, we've got another good one here. Um, so this is from somebody who says, my company is not large um, on Facebook. So they're not massive on Facebook and most of their connections have some connection financially with the company. So they're B2B and not branded. Most of their interaction, they see when they post things targeted to their employees. So they wanna push forward and use the platform as a marketing asset but we see our employees really want it used for recognition stroke morale. So how do you balance that platform usage in terms of internal versus external content? It's a great question. And that's I Facebook have, Facebook aligned. That is a great question. Um, okay. So my advice here would be to, if you're getting good engagement from your employees and they really want to use that space, then I I'm leaning towards giving that space to them and using it as a workplace group because I'm just thinking with like my algorithm hat on, the more engagement you get, the more people who are gonna see your profile. So if your employees are really engaged and they wanna share that content, you know, they're proud of, you know, a, people are winning awards or someone's getting promoted and they're proud to share that, then that's a great thing. That's a great advocacy for your brand. If your employees are willing to talk about the place that they work and share and allow your brand to share their personal space. So you're taking up space within their personal feed. I think that's a really lovely thing. And I think it's about harnessing that more than trying to fit in sales messaging in and around it potentially look at a different platform to create sales messaging or create um, B2C messaging. But I would say that, that is, that's a really rare thing that you've got because people's feeds are personal. And if they really want to talk about the business, then I would allow them to do that. And I would encourage them to do that because the more they talk about it, the more their connections will see it and the more people it will reach. Fab. Thank you, Leah. Here's one, here's a conundrum for you. And oh, this is no. where the algorithms maybe don't get it right. Um, okay. Incredibly relevant to all of us in this industry. So these guys have had live, have had products rejected by Facebook and Instagram okay. as they don't approve of selling live products. Oh, yeah. Even though fresh fish is actually not live in many, 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 many cases. Mm -hmm. Any advice on getting around this? Um, they've appealed it multiple times, but their approach the, the, the social media platform approach is quite inconsistent on products and responses. 
It is. It Are is. there people behind the keyboards? No. So <laughs> when it comes to post approval, image approval, it's all automated. There's no wiggle room. Um, and my advice would be to, if you're on Instagram, one way around this could be to create carousels so that your first and last image don't feature your live produce because they'll rank the first and last image first. So if you're graphic led, for example, or your first image on Instagram is your shop front or your business front, or it's something to do with people and faces, they'll rank that first. So you can have like an open and closed story almost within an Instagram carousel and then have your produce throughout that. Um, another way to get around this potentially is to create wording across your imagery. So Facebook has now changed its stance on the 20% text rule. So before um, it was the bane of all marketers that you couldn't have more than 20% text on a Facebook image if you were putting money behind it um, or if you, if you were a business page and you wanted it to reach an, um, like a huge amount of people. Um, I'd look to putting text behind or a text in front of the image and then yeah, and just seeing where you get to, but it is all automated. There are no people behind it, but you can connect with a Facebook agent um, and explain who you are, what you do. Potentially, they might ask you to provide identification and business identification. Um, so that, and that will be marked as a record on your account every time you post something. Um, but yeah, is it is it like is it like the fish faces and like seafood? Is that what they think it is? I'm not sure who asked the question. Um, but yeah, th that would be my advice. And if you know if you're consistently trying to post something and it's not working, um, but you're still doing it, Facebook will also mark you down on your content when it does go through. So if you're constantly pushing something that Facebook is telling you isn't right. When your content does get through, it'll be like blacklisted. So it's like cracking a terrible code. So hi, thank you for unmuting me. I'm Michelle. It was me that asked that awful question. I'm so sorry, Leah. No, um, no, no, no. <laughs> it, it, yeah, and it, it's specifically about and it'll anyone that's selling fresh fish mm. online. It, it's the posts are fine. They're fine with with pictures of fresh fish mm -hmm. is actually when you try and link them in the shop function on in instagram's even worse but on facebook mm -hmm. they'll um so say it's i don't know um cod fillets or mm -hmm. you know um john dory or something it'll just come back and say not not a, it basically says it's not not allowing it because it okay. is think it you know we know that it's fresh fish for sale it's not fish in fish in tanks you know yeah so they don't allow live products you know like cats dogs all those sorts of things so simplistically the algorithm is saying that fresh fish is the same so it will allow some products it's not everything is so inconsistent so i'm not expecting an answer now but i think it's probably one for sea fish to perhaps try and flag because it won't just be um it won't just be you no. suffering no so yeah i didn't yeah. mean to put you in the corner no 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 not at all that sounds incredibly frustrating yeah um, and i've been <laughs> in a similar you. situation when i worked uh, with a pharmacy client and every single thing we posted was just drugs so it was like a big no no matter what we did we couldn't have a shop function but what might be good michelle if it's okay with you is um potentially getting my details from love seafood team um, and connect with me personally and then we could maybe share some screenshots I'd definitely like to help you with that or at least figure out how we could help um, yeah, yeah that would be great I think it could yeah. be a good case study for other operators as well because yeah absolutely. They're, they're all going to have this challenge and if someone can fix it then I don't mind who it is so okay. thank you very much Leah and sorry for painting you into to a corner there, didn't mean no to. no that's ab absolutely fine there's a lot of pressure now yeah. I like pressure but that's that's good Great I'll question, Michelle. Th 
Thank you both. <laughs> Not at all. That stuff is invaluable and you're right. It will support other businesses too. So we will, we will take that on on your behalf for others too and find out um, through Leah how we can try and get around that one. Yeah. Um, I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll take one more question. We've got another probably five or six here. Um, so we will answer those. We'll do that offline with support from okay. Leah and we will post that, make it available for everybody alongside the recording. The last one for you, Leah, is another um, seafood related one. So um, somebody here carries out social media content creation and marketing for several fish and chip restaurants across Northern Ireland. In relation to building community and engaging with customers on social media, they're curious for your opinion on practical ways they could boost their social community involvement in addition to efficient replying and regular content posting. So it's kind of doing it all, isn't it? Boost yeah. the community involvement, engagement, mm -hmm. efficient replies, responses, community management, and efficient content building. Oh, I feel like we need a whole other presentation. For <laughs> um, so Fish and Chip community, one of my favorite Facebook groups is, and you're all probably members of it, but Fish and Chip UK, I love it. Every Friday, hundreds of people share just fish and chips and it's been so nice during lockdown um people making fish and chips at home it's been great we've amplified some of it on their uh, love love seafood channels as well and we're quite active within that group um creating community engagement okay first first place to start is always your insights it's always research it's always going through what has worked in the past and what hasn't worked in the past and that also includes what's worked for you as a business. So if you've seen uptake in footfall or sales or growth from certain pieces of content, I would start by identifying those first and foremost. And that will help you to inform your content production or will help you inform what people want to see. And then you can build community around that. So for example, Fish and chips, you know, controversy is always good with fish and chips, sadly. You know, is it, you know, I'm not, I'm from Dublin, but lived in Edinburgh for a very long time. Chippy sauce is a big thing. Is it salt and sauce? Is it curry sauce? Is it mushy peas? Um, is it salt and vinegar? How, how people eat their fish and chips? And you've 100% talked about this as a team or you'll or already know this but how people consume it will definitely be the number one thing that they'll talk about or 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 and how people enjoy it and who they enjoy it with so potentially there's something around community building around who you enjoy your fish and chips with is it a special moment is it you know for me whenever i have a fish whenever i have a chippy it's always about Friday nights, mom never cooked, we always got a chippy. And I come from like a really small seaside town just outside Dublin. So it's more, it's potentially more about that emotive side of fish and chips. You know, we refer to it as the nation's favorite because it is the nation's favorite. So tapping into why it is the nation's favorite, why it's your audience's favorite, um, rather than just posting opening times or menus or, things like that and then I guess is also if you're running multiple fish and chip shops social tapping into those local communities so really using localized groups and local hashtags and um, amplifying other things that are happening within that community through your social media platforms through your comments and um, through your community management really being a key part of that social community I mentioned earlier you know that I've just moved to Glasgow and the first thing I did was join a Dennis and Facebook group make sure you're in those Facebook groups make sure you're present and people can see you um, and that you know you don't have to be in those groups tracking things every single day but you know you're just checking them you're making sure that people know that you're there um if people are posting about fish and chips or even just fish or um people posting you know there was a huge uh, trend on tiktok about people making recipes out of potatoes you know be part of that conversation because chips come from potatoes so um yeah you utilizing those localized groups um and building community and content around the emotive side of fish and chips. Um, 
but yeah that's more conversation definitely I think get my details from from Love Seafood and I can talk to you more about exactly what you are doing now and what you need to be doing or what you would like to be doing brilliant Leah thank you so much so on behalf of Seafish um, and Love Seafood thanks again everybody and thank you Leah